uh, I want to do for a really long time, which is to build uh, radio transceivers for amateur radio. So the generally amateur radio is done with commercially built equipment, which is great, but that's sort of you know, a bit divorced from the, the hardware itself. So that's an off-the-shelf radio. Uh, it does some absurd range of frequencies and modes, not a lot of power, but uh, it's an extremely flexible device, but it's also not very practical to muck around inside it. So I've wanted for a very, very long time to build my own radios uh, from scratch, and so I've cheated a little bit, so I've started with a kit, but uh, this is the first one I built, which is this guy here. It's a single band receiver, and it's only the front half of a receiver. So it's, it backs onto a sound card, and then you do most of the work in, a, uh, in software in the computer. So this is no longer a particularly popular design. It was popular about a decade ago. Um, Jeremiah Wong bought a bunch of these things and never had time to build them, so he gifted them to me on the condition that I do actually eventually build them. <laughs> it's taken me two or three years to get to that point, but have finally started. Um, so this the context was uh, the recent Maker Fair, or Maker Extravaganza, as we now call it. Um, because it was held at the Science Center, I felt the need to build another ridiculous antenna. <laughs> so we did. Um, although the speaker is in the way, uh, the oh hello, um, the top of the antenna is just barely in frame, but that's only because we didn't raise it to its full height. This is only 20 of the 26 meters. Um, so the deal is that you lay out 20 meters out on the ground, like this. It's basically a fishing pole. You stand it up, and then you push the remaining six meters up. Uh, I think I have a shot of someone on a ladder, which will make clear how that works. Uh, well, it gives you, gives you the idea. So, yes. <laughs> okay, not so obvious. Uh, the segments... Oh, for God's sake. Let me stop that. Why is it... You pressed the button accidentally. No, I think I've pressed F5, which it's interpreted as slideshow rather than full screen. So let's not press F5. We'll solve that problem. So it packs, the whole thing packs into a box about this long. Uh, somewhat impractical. It means you need to rent a van to move it around. Um, which is the reason for the ladder. So the, the segments are here. And so in this configuration, the bottom about five segments are all collapsed. <coughs> So we've pulled out the top 20 meters, and there are basically um, hose clamps with a bit of lining rubber and then covered in heat shrink. At the, when, you, when you have two pieces, one piece going into another, like this, you put a hose clamp around the top and tighten it to stop it from falling. Because the, the usual way the thing it fails is to fall into itself. So the top 11 were tightened, the bottom four are all loose about here somewhere, and the pieces are all uh, collapsed. And it was just too hot and too unpleasant. Um, not much as obvious in the photos, but we were drenched. It was, there was not even the slightest breeze, which is great for putting up the mast, but very, very inconvenient for the people who were putting it up. <laughs> you were with us on the, the previous Saturday or the... I was uh, before the event itself. Yeah, that's, that's this day. You, so you are somewhere in these photos. Um, so, yeah, there's other, sorry, the photos are really out of order, but I'll show you what I've got uh, in some sort of rational order. So the way the, uh, the receiver works is a little bit unusual. Uh, the way most contemporary receivers work is they're what are called, is called a superheterodyne. So you've got a front section, which is the antenna and ground, maybe a preamp, a uh, thing called a frequency mixer with an, a variable oscillator. And so the tuning of the radio is achieved by changing the frequency at that point. And the mixer creates some indifference. So you end up, typically you have a if you've got a FM radio receiver, um, you're tuning you know, 98 megahertz. Typically what's going on is that the VFO is at 87 megahertz. And so the mixer, what then goes out into the intermediate frequency stage is 11 megahertz, is at, at about a center of 11 megahertz. And so what you do is you have a, a fixed frequency uh, intermediate section after the first mixer. So you're varying the, the VFO when you're turning the tuning dial, but the the, VF, the os variable frequency oscillator's output is 11 megahertz below or above the frequency that appears on the dial, 
meaning that the thing that is in the intermediate section is an 11 megahertz signal, and then you do all of your filtering and demodulating and other processing on a signal that's always at the same frequency. You then have another mixer and an 11 megahertz oscillator to bring it down to baseband to get the audio out. So it's a typical superheterodyne uh, arrangement for radio. Superheterodyne meaning multiple energies or frequencies. Uh, this one works a bit differently. Uh, so, most importantly, it uses a fixed frequency oscillator. It's a crystal. And there's no bending, the crystal is simply running at its uh, resonant frequency, which is approximately four times the frequency of interest. So for the one that I've built, I'm interested in approximately seven megahertz, or what amateurs call 40 meters, which is where, because the wavelengths are about 40 meters long. Uh, therefore, the crystal is at about 28 megahertz. So you bring in from your uh, antenna and counterpoise system, or your antenna system, uh, there's a low-pass filter, uh, and then a simple power splitter, which is just a hand-wound inductor. Uh, it's not exactly the one I photographed, but it's a similar idea. That In this radio, there are two hand-wound inductors that are something like that. It's a little uh, yellow torus that is perhaps a centimeter in diameter, and you're just sort of winding wire around it by, by hand. This is part of the low-pass filter, so that's this one here, um, which has a single winding. There's another that has three windings. And all this, one do, all this one does is splits the power in half. And the reason for that is that this is a front end to a digital signal processing system where it's, in general, DSP is done with in-phase and quarter measurements. So instead of just uh, digitizing the way a sound card digitizes for sound or a MIDI setup does to put out a stream of samples to a, a speaker where if you're at 44.1 kilohertz then it's every 44,100 of a second you've, you're taking a sample. In DSP you take one at that rate and then one offset by a quarter of a cycle. And that's why the frequency, the crystal has to be at four times. So you, in essence you're taking two 7 megahertz samples, one offset by a quarter cycle from the other. And then that passes through an analog switch and into the left and right audio of a high definition sound card. And so that, and then the radio itself is a piece of software. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a very simple bit of electronics. An oscillator, the dividers are just a pair of flip-flops to get a, a two-bit number that goes into an analog switch. And as described, you've got nothing more than a low-pass filter, a coil to split it and two loading resistors, uh, and then some biasing for the for the two op amps that feed the uh, the sound card. There's literally nothing else uh, on the board. So it still took a while to work it out, and, and various things like learning how to solder uh, surface mount. That was exciting. Um, these are fiddly things, and the um, all, I've started work on the transceiver, which is a bit more complicated and has even more fiddly chips on it, including chips that are smaller. So there are three and five leg chips that are smaller than this, <laughs> and others which have legs that are embedded inside the case and all sorts of complicated stuff. But that was cool. It all worked. Uh, no components damaged, not one joint failed, but it took me a number of nights to, uh, to get it together. The winding of the coils was, I think, the most interesting piece, uh, but actually it's pretty simple. It really is just winding wire around inductors. And at this level, it turns out not to be very precise. If you've only, you can't have a partial winding. If you're putting 11 windings, I think the left one's 11 windings, uh, on a coil, you can't have 11.1 .1 windings or 10.9 windings. It's exactly 11 windings. And so whatever your circuit needs the, the, the inductance to be, there's got to be somewhere else in the circuit to deal with the error. And so um, there's two things going on. One is we don't care all that much. So the fact that this thing is plus or minus 10% simply because you can only have an integer number of turns uh, the capacitor is chosen to cope with that. In fact, I measured it with an LCR bridge. It's not. It's almost 15% higher than what the design of the circuit calls for. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but I'm reasonably convinced that the meter is correct. Uh, so, yeah, this is an interesting piece that's avoided because there's no meaningful counterpart in solid state. In solid state, you can have resistors, you can have diodes, you can have transistors, you can even have small capacitors. Granted, you often need additional capacitors to compensate, but there's just no way to, good way to do an inductor. And so in general, you sort of, where possible, say, well, if I need a series inductor, I'll just make a bigger parallel capacitor. 
Uh, the reason that doesn't work very well for the front end of a radio is that these two form what is called a tank circuit. And so there's actually energy being transfer transferred back and forth between the capacitor and the inductor. And so if you, which is part of the circuit running at resonance, if you replace the inductor with just a bigger capacitor, that doesn't occur. And so you end up uh, transferring less of the energy that's coming in from the antenna. So there's, there are reasons for the use of inductors at the sort of very low power parts or low signal parts of a circuit. In addition to the, the use in power supplies for you know, smoothing noise, you'll also find them right at the front of RF systems because you can't do the same things with capacitors. But yeah, once you get past this very front end of the radio, there are no more inductors. They're, they're fiddly to work with. Um, what else I wanted to show you? So this was... So the program that I use is a thing called Quisk. Um, the one that's normally used for this is a thing called Rocky, which is a Windows app. But as I don't use Windows, th that's not very practical. So I'm using Quisk instead. Um, this is a conventional way for amateurs to look at, not just amateurs, to look at signals in a digital domain. The axes are frequency this way, power this way, measured in uh, negative decibels relative to whatever full power would be. It would look like if you've got a 24-bit 24 24 bit ADC, which this does, then 2 to 24 minus 1 would be the top. Uh, at minus 100, say so minus 90 dB, you're at about a billionth of that, which is, I should be able to lose my head, but I can't. Um, I, th I think you're down to about 2 bits. The bottom might be more, might be, no, that can't be right. A bit more, but you get the idea that, that the with a 24-bit ADC, your dynamic range is substantial so long as the device can really do it. And allegedly, this, which is a Asus Zonar, can. Uh, the other thing you need, and this is because of the, the strange design of the, or the unusual design of the radio, that because, whereas conventional radios have a variable frequency oscillator up front to bring the input signal down into a fixed frequency IF, and that meant then mentioned all your filtering and demodulation at a fixed frequency, in this case, the oscillator, it's not quite a mixer, but it behaves a bit like one, uh, the oscillator is fixed frequency. If you wanted to tune, what you actually have to do is op operations in software. And I haven't got it working, but the... You can see time? Or you, no, yeah. no, I mean, um, I'm probably a bit over. Um, but if you... In order to receive a signal, which is more or less what's happening here, without much success, is you tune the radio program to say, uh, operate at... 10 kilohertz above carrier or above center, and you also specify a, a width, how much uh, spectrum to to convert. The thing below is a time series. So in this case, the right now is the top, and then sort of this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, perhaps it's, it might be 45 seconds, top to bottom. And then color is used to indicate intensity. So what you can see is off the edges here, there's basically nothing. Um, there's something here, even though you can't, and this is again a normal part of a spectrum display and it's why amateurs use waterfalls, because the waterfall will allow you to see a signal that you can't see just by looking at the instantaneous intensity graph. But this yellow here tells you there's something happening around here. And so if you sort of tune your radio to the middle and set the width to about that width, you'll get, you'll demodulate whatever it is. Um, it doesn't look like voice and it doesn't look like a clean digital signal. I would hazard a guess it's a piece of industrial machinery making noise, but <laughs> it's, that's the sort of thing that it allows you to do. Um, the other big thing that this allows you to determine is how wide the response of the sound card is. The fact that the thing is rolling off quite sharply, it's, it's not quite vertical, but it's certainly almost 45 degrees, uh, means that there's something going on the sound card whereby at approximately 24 kilohertz either side of the center, there's nothing, meaning that the the passband is about 48 kilohertz wide. It is supposed to be 192 kilohertz in the in this configuration. I don't know if you can see it. Nope, doesn't show it. it it's, in theory, it's, it's supposed to be something at 192 kilohertz, and it's supposed to have sufficient passband in the analog front end to do that. And the radio certainly has it. Uh, this is interesting because, with one exception, all of the amateur bands in HF fit within <coughs> 200, fit in 200 kilohertz. So if you've got a 200 kilohertz wide ADC, ADC, then you need one crystal per amateur band, of which there are about eight. And so you, you sort of build, at the, at, as this is designed, you actually build a separate radio per, uh, per band. So that's 
that's the guts of it. Uh, the rest is various construction things. Ah, this is the power splitter. Uh, there's a problem with the with loading, which is why they're unbalanced. I haven't yet got a very good explanation of what happened there. But this is measured uh, basically these two red dots. So I put in a carrier. I just have my radio transmitting with no modulation and well, a line of attenuators so it's not to damage anything. Um, and then measured here and here. And what you're seeing is what you expect to see, which is two signals that are sine waves, give or take the quantization noise in the, in, in the instrument, um, and that are exactly out of phase with each other, which is important for the design of the rest of the circuit. Uh, the re why the amplitudes are not the same, I am not sure. But I swapped them over, and the, it, the curves stayed the same shape. If there was a problem in the device, you would expect the if you swap them, the yellow curve would be small, the blue curve would be bigger, but that didn't happen. When I swapped them, they stayed exactly in this relationship. So there's some sort of instrumentation problem, I don't know what. Um, and the other, yeah, if you look at the the centers, uh, I was transmitting about 7 megahertz. I haven't got the screenshot, but uh, it's, it, it comes out correctly. So very pleasing to have, you know, the, uh, an oscilloscope show very simply that the thing was doing what it was supposed to do. Um, oh, the other thing was the, this is a bit less clear, but I wanted to get a sense of what the filtering at the front end was doing. And it actually has a bit of a band pass rather than purely a, a low pass character. But I realized the other reason that the precision of the inductors doesn't matter is that all the filter has to do is prevent aliasing at half or double. Mm. And so it doesn't have to be within 10%, it only has to be within 100%. So it can be very, very rough. And so, although I don't trust the calibration of the, uh, the spectrum analyzer, what I did here was put a, uh, a wideband uh, noise source, uh, cheap things, basically a diode with some amplifiers in front of it, uh, connected it to uh, the input of the, the radio front end, and then once again tapped, I forget that I tapped here or here, but was then looking at the frequency response across the band. And it's doing more or less what you expect, which is to uh, cut off, that's four megahertz of spectrum, and the center, can't read the center in this photo. Is that any clearer? Oh, the center is 7.1, okay. Which, so this is more or less the plan. But the, the, the crystal is about 28 megahertz. The middle diameter band is 7.1 megahertz, which is about there. The whole thing's about four megahertz wide. And as you can see, there's quite a clean roll off or quite a clear roll off, uh, call it two and a half, three megahertz either side of the, the carrier, meaning that aliases um, don't get in. What this does not solve is if you have a nearby powerful transmitter. Um, so up until fairly recently, uh, the BBC ran its shortwave transmissions from here in Singapore. And so if I was listening to an amateur you know, half across the world and at a frequency very close to the BBC's transmissions, then there would be uh, harmonics and modulation distortion and other spurs that risk swamping the signal I'm after, despite the fact they're actually separate, because there is the, this filter is very broad, but enough for the purposes of running the radio. Um, that's, ah, yes. So the antenna analyzer is a tool for analyzing antennas. Um, this is what the antenna looked like up on top of the, the mast. So it was just wire, this yellow wire you can see. Uh, cut, no it wasn't you, it was two other guys who were there with me, uh, one from the science center and the son of one of my friends. I said, yeah, uh, cut a piece 10 meters long and two bits 20 meters long and, and I'll, you've got the 10 meter vertical and then the two 20 meter bits connected in the middle and that's the two halves of the antenna and there's nothing else. There are no loading coils, there's no magic, there's just a bit of coax. And yet, miraculously, this, the, the center of its resonance is at 7.11 megahertz. The amateur band center is at 7.1. This is within a quarter of a percent of the, or eighth of a percent of the middle of the band, which I thought was pretty awesome. Um, and its standing wave ratio was 1.13, which is getting pretty close to uh, practical optimum. A theoretically perfect antenna is a 1.0 standing wave ratio, meaning all energy that goes out, goes out, nothing comes back. Uh, in this case, there's an amount of reflection, but for amateurs, anything below 1.3 is generally considered near enough to perfect and with help most radios can work with anything all the way down to about three so this was that this is uh two and a half so the amateur band 
uh, is 100 kilohertz is here. So it's below two across the entire band. Beautifully clean antenna. Uh, and part of that is it was far above the ground. So often you make an antenna by putting a, having a vertical wire and then you just lay radios on the ground, which they're then coupled to the ground and, and messy. In this case, they were 10 meters above the ground and therefore behave the way the mathematics say they behave. Uh, worked fairly well to receive with the commercial receiver. Uh, transmitting mixed. Uh, unfortunately, I had software problems on the day. And so the, uh, I was unable to use the receiver. So a lot of mucking about. Um, oh, this is how we got Wi-Fi out of the field. <laughs> so basically, I put a 100 meters of wire from our booth, the Hackerspace booth in the Maker Extravaganza out to the, the loading bay. Um, and then uh, that's, that, the coax goes to the, the booth. And then that's just a Wi-Fi access point with a 10-fold gain antenna. And it's basically pointing 100 meters out to the, the field where there's like a Raspberry Pi and the sound card of the, the bit. So yeah, all of that worked. The antenna worked. The mast worked. Everything worked except the software running on the, on the laptop. <laughs> Such is life. Uh, I think that was all. Um, no. Eh. What's going on? Oh yes, and because it was a sign center, of course it was appropriately sign posted. <laughs> you put a big cordon around it. Because it was unattended. I didn't want people wandering in there and then complaining about that they'd tripped on the rope and had the thing fall on their head. But also, it's Singapore, right? You get thunderstorms. If we'd got this up to 26 meters, it would have been taller than anything in the vicinity, including lightning conductors. So it's basically a freestanding lightning conductor. As a result, this was the other reason for running using Wi-Fi rather than running Cat5 all the way out to the the antenna because if it was if it's struck by lightning like this then okay you vaporize the mast and equipment and I'd be very sad if it's struck by lightning and there's a cat 5 cable going back into the maker fair then we have a problem you know, fires deaths all that sort of thing um, so that, yeah there was this comes up and the, the science center is now getting a bit more thorough about uh, risk management this year they actually required risk assessments like formal documented risk assessments which they've never done before um, but yeah was concerned enough that I had did something similar last year. Uh, yeah, this is the somewhat underpopulated booth, and this was the uh, oh, testing access point inside the uh, the fair. There's like dozens of uh, Wi-Fi networks, but the you know, being right next to the access point meant that it worked. Uh, I think that was all. Questions, comments? Didn't you have a, a, a whole adventure with the? Uh, ADC side of things on the. Well, I haven't resolved it yet. So that oh yeah, sorry. That's what's the point of that of the. Because I remember the hacker, uh, the, the the Facebook post about that. Right. So the, the difficulty here is that uh, quite clearly this runs from about minus twenty three ish kilohertz to about plus twenty three. So that's a forty six call it forty eight kilohertz wide. So this is a. Um, Call it an audiophile gamer's sound card. I'm like, yes, okay, fine. It, mostly it's about output. Like, there's a super high frequency, super high resolution output and 7.1 so you can do all the effects and surround sound. And so it claims 192 kilohertz on the input, but there's, there's like, this is probably fake. And uh, in fact, Adam spent some time looking at chipsets and it's not just at, at the card level, it's all the way down to the, right down to the chips that it's likely to be untrue. Uh, and so, you know, I had configured it to 192 kilohertz, and yet you can see from this that it's very clearly only processing a 48 kilohertz wide slice of spectrum. If it was feeding, so in other words, although the software is handing over 192,000 second fat samples per second to each of the left and right channels, what's really going on is it's 48,000 samples, each of which is being handed over four times, just the same sample again and again and again. And so that then means that there is no component of the signal that has a more than 24 kilohertz deviation from the from the center. And so you therefore, we're only decoding 48 kilohertz around the middle of the band. And the, the point of having gone out and sort of bought this thing was that it should be capable of processing 192 kilohertz and therefore the, the entire 7 to 7.2 megahertz that, that amateurs use, give or take where the crystal is actually operating. Uh, so yeah, I just like that's, that really sucks. 
So I posted this on Facebook and quite a few people uh, hopped on and commented and went looking around and it turns out that this thing really can do what it's supposed to do. Uh, there's a data acquisition community who uses basically sound cards for lab use uh, and therefore they care a lot about the behavior of these devices and so carefully assessed and revised and someone found a review of six or seven such devices. This one topped the review. So it's, it's credible. The soft rock community, which is the community of people who make these particular category of radio, several people claim that yes, they are able to get the full 200 kilohertz or 192 kilohertz width, which means this graph would be four times as wide. Uh, but yeah, I haven't, uh, haven't run that one down yet. Uh, there's a bunch of things. There are, there's, there's multiple inputs, there's questions about how to configure it, um, and there's certainly the possibility that the performance that the software guys are seeing is only possible with the Asus drivers on Windows. Oh. So I don't, I don't know. I, I just sort of fired it up. I said, yes, do 192 kilohertz, because obviously if I tell you that, you'll do that, won't you? Uh, Pulse Audio is definitely supposed to be capable of it, although it behaved the same way whether you did it with Pulse or directly. But from looking at it, even though it's claiming 192 and it's providing 192, it's very clearly only providing 48 kilohertz worth of, worth of samples, which means basically repeated samples. So yeah, I haven't put any time into it since Mega Fair. I hauled all the gear back, put it all away, went to bed, uh, then got sick. So I was unwell for most of the following week. Thankfully that didn't occur until the day after Mega Fair. That would have been appalling. Uh, so no, tonight's the first time I've uh, played with it since. So yeah, no progress yet. But, uh, but given, yes, that, that this was a post to Facebook and a whole lot of people jumped up and found useful stuff. So I'm fairly optimistic that uh, it will be possible to do the full 200 kilohertz, 200 kilohertz wide slice and therefore to using this super simple design listen to the full uh, 40 meter amateur demand. Uh, don't know whether I'll build the rest I've got enough of the kits to build about five so to do uh, different bands but what I really want to do is transmit that's kind of the point of the exercise and so I've started work on the transceiver it was not ready for make a fair and still isn't but uh, I'm working towards which then points to the next part of this puzzle which is regulatory and uh, IMGA either didn't understand what I said or didn't care. It's not yet entirely clear to me, but as it stands, <laughs> they have been advised in writing uh, of my intention to build and operate a set of soft rock kits. Uh, no one's done it. None of the amateurs in Singapore have built their own radios before. Um, in fact, Jeremiah would have been the first had he done it. Uh, so there are two ways you can deal with this. One is uh, not bother to mention it to IMDA. Actually, sorry, it's not quite true. You've built your own radios? Mm, Started to. All right. Uh, so almost no one, but certainly no one had any idea how to get through uh, IMDA's hoops because we, we are still saddled with an obligation to have every radio that's part of our license, or part of our station, listed on our license, right down to serial numbers. And I believe, uh, I, I believe uh, Matt has spoken to IMDA, and they say that as long as you can uh, come up with test reports, Yep. showing the performance of, uh, of the radio, uh, you can get it approved. Uh, but I guess for most, for most people, that may not, may not be a fairly uh, trivial task, especially if you don't have access to equipment. So that, yeah, there's a couple of things there. Uh, I had a look, careful look at the IMDA spec, and there's not much. There's only four things you've got to, got to verify, that the frequencies are correct. Mm -hmm. And that's now easy to do with a GPS discipline oscillator. Oscill 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 it used to be the case you had to have really sort of expensive standards and you had to have you know, a traceable path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you just get an oscillator. It can be rubidium, it can be quartz, uh, and a GPS receiver and a, a feedback loop to discipline. And you will get a frequency standard to correct to around 10 to minus 11 or 10 parts per billion. Uh, and this is like a $100 item, maybe a $200 item. So it's, it's very easy to do frequency. So let's really just sit down and verify that the radio doesn't sort of only sets to frequencies that the spec sheet says it, um, it sets to. Uh, power levels, similarly, are not that challenging. You need a power meter, you need a dummy load. Um, uh, strictly speaking, I've got a power meter, I've got a dummy load. Mm -hmm. But they're easy enough to get, and certainly I've got most of the, everything here except the power meter, actually. I can prove by construction that I, can't, I don't exceed the legal limit. But of course, they want to test it against the spec sheet. Um, Emission modes, I've just made a written submission to IMDA to remove that. That doesn't make any sense at all. It made sense in the 1960s. Uh, the standards that are part of the regulation in the handbook 
appear to date from pre-independence. Yeah. Uh, and like I even found, coincidentally, while trying to decode one of the phrases, which says something very specific in one of the footnotes, I'm like, I don't understand what those words actually mean. I mean, individually, yes. But I don't know what point is being made. So I punched the phrase into Google. And what I found was a 1965 uh, amateur radio handbook from the UK. Like, and like even the weird thing is like the footnotes have both letters and numbers for no readily apparent reason. It's like seven footnotes with numbers and then four with letters. And like, why? Well, it's, they've just copied it from, yeah, from this 50-year-old document. So, uh, yeah, I, at the moment, I'm, it's just, you need to basically say, yes, I tested it and it can only use modes that are listed in the amateur uh, grants within Singapore, but hopefully it'll just go away. Um, the only difficult one is spurious emissions. It's not even clear from the way the standard is written whether you're obliged to have testing done to, for spurs. It's a very strangely worded sentence, but I, the best assumption is that you are obliged. But the standard for HF gear is not difficult. It's minus 40 dBc. And so all that means is uh, if you've got a spectrum analyzer that's not completely broken, uh, what you are looking for is this is a broadband noise source, so it's close to flat. But if you're testing, so you've got your radio plugged into a dummy load and you're tapping, uh, or attenuator and you're tapping to input to the spectrum analyzer, you key down for the transmitter, and so your carrier appears for the sake of argument here. So you've turned the power level down and maybe you've put some attenuators in line to prevent damaging the instrument. What the standard is, is that the spurs must be 40 dB below the carrier. So what you then do is count down, one, two, three, four, and as long as any spurs, usually they start at double, like the first harmonic, are below that line then you've passed. And so that's all. And so, yeah, what I said to IMDA was, yes, I will, uh, <laughs> I'll find it actually. It shouldn't be too hard to find. Uh, These attenuators you talked about come in 10 dB steps. Various, usually 3 dB and 10 dB steps, yeah. So you just string them up for 20, 30? Yep, okay. I did, don't think I photographed it, but I had them set up for exactly that purpose when I did the, the two, the power splitter test, because right. I didn't want to damage the, the instrument. Um, now that's the old one. Right, so that, that's my equipment register that I have provided to IMDA, and they said, that's awesome, thank you. Um, this is basically proposed to build because I haven't built them yet. And all I did was said it was added a condition, no use on here until the IMDA technical standard amateur radio compliance with technical requirements is met and that test records be retained for inspection. So I didn't even enter into the argument about who tests. Historically, IMDA wanted radios sort of taken away to a lab to be tested. It's like, because of the three tests I've just described are all you've got to do, it seems ridiculous to involve a testing lab. And so I've just said I'm going to, before I put them on air, perform the tests and keep records. We've got to keep records anyway. We've got to keep log books and we've got to keep a copy of the license. Uh, so this is not particularly onerous. So that, that's, that's how I tackled it. And so I also provided spec sheets. It's like, okay, you want a spec sheet? All right, I'll give you a spec sheet. No problem. Hooray. <laughs> Voila. So what is, what is this A1A, A1B? Right, so these are the modes, and th these are the, the piece that I had suggested that should just disappear. But what would this stand for? Uh, okay, so A1A, okay, basically a code that stands okay, for, for what kind of modulation it is. So A1A will represent amplitude modulation at what kind? So, for, so, okay, so uh, if there's a, there's a, there's a, built key, into the, there's a key somewhere that explains uh, what it is. So all, uh, all the stuff uh, harks back to the ITU radio regulations, okay, which yeah. are updated after each World Radio Conference. Sure. Uh, there's one happening now. Or last week, and so there'll be a. So the the last conference prior to what's just happened was in it was in 2015, and the, therefore the last version of the regs came out in 2016. So in essence, all the actions that were taken during the conference get sort of editorially assembled over the following six months. So I'd expect that by about sort of April, we'll have a, a new version of the regs, and so frequency allocations, use limitations, and in some cases emission modes. But I went through. It's a monster, it's a two and a half thousand page document, uh, but there are no constraints on amateur emission modes anywhere in the world. There are all sorts of constraints on power in particular cases and, and a bunch of things, but there isn't a single case 
where there's an amateur service limitation on emission so lines anymore. It's a combination anymore. of modulation schemes and frequency? So three things. The first, the first letter is the modulation. Yeah. And so A is double sideband, or AM essentially. Um, the second is how many modulating signals there are, and also what they are. So, um, this, so if you're doing continuous wave or Morse code, uh, one way to do it is literally continuous wave, yeah. where you just you you key your transmitter as a sine wave at a particular frequency. Another fairly popular way to do it is using a subcarrier, yeah. and this is perhaps more relevant for. It's it's a bit meaningless if you're doing single sideband or. Oh no! For, sorry for AM. Yes. So if you if you have an AM transmitter, then you put say a three kilohertz tone on top. So you then got your carrier plus uh, sidebands three up and down that are one quarter the power of the carrier. It's kind of a wasteful way of doing it. You'd rather have all the power in the, in the carrier and then reconstructing the receiver. But that's, so that's what that one is. Uh, one channel analog is uh, things like single sideband um, and various digital multiples, etc. And then the third character is a letter describing what it is that's being transmitted, whether oh, it's uh, right. uh, so beacon. Application layer kind of. Yeah, experience. more or less. Uh, uh, None of the above mean. So they're transmitting like, like alien data. Uh, yeah, it, hard to say. I can't think Human of. There might, let's, <laughs> there might be some examples. Um, more details, so images can be grayscale, color, etc. Uh, when this stuff was adopted, there was no question of you know having two hundred different uh, frame formats for images. So, right, they're not relevant. Um, multiplexing. So bear in mind, these codes are used to describe everything, in particular to, to describe mobile phone systems, where this matters. How how multiple parties sharing a piece of frequency cooperate is the. And then finally, although they're not listed in the Wikipedia page, uh, you often get a number, which is the bandwidth in kilohertz uh, of the the signal. So broadcasters usually use A3E. So AM, single channel analog, um, uh, voice, phone, basically. Right? Uh, F80 is the same thing, but it's FM instead of AM. Um, there's TV things. Uh, oh, sorry, these, so these are the bandwidth comes before rather than after. So 11K2 is 11.2 kilohertz. Uh, FM3E, I forget what that is. Um, NON is basically uh, beacons. So nothing, no, no, no modulation, no modulation form and no information content. It's a beacon for direction finding. Um, Do they still exist, these things? This How do you think planes work out where they are? Oh, <laughs> Oh, yes, we depend upon SatNav in case this long satellites work. Yeah, uh, so in Singapore. We have transmitters for these. You oh, bet. Yes. There we, are th we have a number of them. Three, so or, three or four? Yeah, what we call uh, EORs and DBs. I'm sure Ken Wing can tell you all about them. Yeah, um, with relation to ships? Uh, aircraft. Oh, aircraft. Oh. So that is a ring of antennas. So this is this is bizarre. This is um, the using AM and FM on the same thing at the same time, so that the receiver knows for, for the plane to work out the um, the bearing to a beacon. It doesn't have to depend on its own instrumentation. Instead, it measures the phase angle in, in the two parts. No. Between the AM and the FM. Yeah. So with just one beacon. You can immediately put yourself on a line. You know just by measuring the phase angle between the two parts of the signal that you are 222 degrees, maybe it's five degrees, 225 degrees from a particular beacon which is identified by a call sign being played occasionally. And so there's, uh, they're, all, they're all similar sizes. Oh no, no, the Alaskan one is harp. That's a different thing. <laughs> but these, there are about four of these in Singapore and they're all set up more or less this way, that there's just sort of improbably, the trees have just disappeared for one little bit, and you've got uh, this circular antenna and next to it, a, basically, a uh, transmitter station. What are they called? Uh, directional beacons, but, uh, but uh, they're also... They're non-directional beacons. 
VHF or mean directional range of VORs, but these are likely NDVs. No, no, no. This is what I'm saying. They have a two-part modulation, meaning that merely by being able to hear it, you can work out what direction you are from it by doing a phase angle comparison between the two parts of the signal. This is a directional beacon. This is the VHF, which the VHF ones typically are. I guess you still need uh, altitude, right? So you need to. Yeah, but that, you can get that with a barometer, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> or enough. But it, yeah, so that's, I, when I understood why, it makes a lot of sense. But I, yeah, I'd never heard of it before, and then, so that's... Can we go on a trip there? Can see some here? I don't know what the deal is. Um, I sort of assume it's got one of those signs with, like, the stencil, like, this. <laughs> and, you know, please, <laughs> don't step on the grass. <laughs> but I... I just, I was curious, I went looking, and all four of them are, because of course their locations are public information. Right? The, the pilots have to know exactly where a beacon is located, so it's not hard to find them. And that all four of them are just like this. There are a circular antenna in, the, in a clearing surrounded by trees. That's all right, I think we made the point. Right. It's probably enough rambling. Any <laughs> anything else at this point? No. Right. I think that's what you come to. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Of course. Is it safe?